Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, certainly a, a very serious issue that um, I'm going to talk about, uh, a very sad one, as was mentioned earlier. Um, I want to start by just paying my respects to the traditional owners of um, both the area where we are meeting today, the Yorta Yorta, but also of the Lower Darling, the Farkinji, who are among the community members who have been deeply affected by um, the events that transpired there over the last summer. Um, and that's something I'll just touch on again uh, as I go through. Um, I, d I really just want to present to you um, the, a brief summary of the effectively what happened and what uh, our analysis led us to understand the contribution of various causative factors to be. So there was a lot of, um, obviously, a, a huge amount of attention focused on this issue, um, rightly so, um, from the community, and, um, and, and, and it generated a lot of interest. But also, there's various opinions floating around out there, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that I can sort of um, provide some of the information that we were able to collate uh, uh, to understand those issues. Apologise, some of the um, text on my slides be, may be a little hard for those up the back in particular to read, so I apologise for that, but um, I think I'll be able to uh, talk you through it effectively um, and, and therefore um, you won't have to be able to read everything on the slides and if there's any questions that people have, there'll be an opportunity later today. So, as, as you may be aware, there are actually three major fish kill events that occurred um, between December and January um, over the last summer uh, in two uh, weir pools um, very close to Menindee, upstream of Weir 32. For people who know that area, I'll show you a map in a moment. There are a number of native species affected, including Murray Cod, but also Golden Perch um, and Boney Brim and Silver Perch. And as I mentioned, that these events deeply affected the local community and we saw you know, lots of images like this on, on the, in newspapers, on the news, um, uh, of, of these very large and old Murray Cod. And I think the two, there were two fish that were aged uh, by New South Wales Fisheries at about 25 and 27 years of age. So the area, I don't think the pointer shows up very well here, but for those who are, I, I suspect most of you are familiar with, broadly with where um, we're talking about it, at Menindi on the Lower Darling, you can see on the map there. As I mentioned, these are the main species that were affected. There were various estimates ranging from sort of tens of thousands up to uh, a million or more fish that had that died. Bony herring made up a very large number of those, being small fish that, that um, are highly sensitive to changes in water quality and occur in very large numbers, but equally there were um, you know, distressingly large numbers of, of fish like golden perch and Murray cod that died in these events. There was a very quick response, and I, I think it's really worth mentioning that um, Amongst those who were affected by these events, um, the fisheries staff who had to go out and respond to them were amongst those who I think had a really tough time of it for a period, um, as well as the local community. Um, the responses ranged from trialling and, and deploying aerators to try and create local uh, refuges of oxygen. I'll talk about the factors that led to the actual deaths and why oxygen was a factor in that in a moment or lack thereof. Um, but deploying aer aerators and also um, starting to, to collect fish that could be moved initially into hatchery um, ponds for holding as rescue populations, but as Andy said, there's been su um, subsequent efforts to also move fish to other habitats. So that response um, was very rapid and, and as, as much as pos possible, I think there's good evidence to show that some of these aerators were effective in, in at least protecting at least a, um, uh, fish in some of the some of the remnant water holes. Another component of the response was that um, both the government but also the opposition, um, independently from one another, um, commissioned two um, inquiries into the causes of these events. And um, as Anthony said, I was involved in one of those. The panel that was led by uh, Professor Robert Tessy, um, which was the, the independent panel um, that reported to uh, David Littleproud, the water minister. And there was another panel that was led by the Australian Academy of Sciences, um, Craig Moritz. I want to emphasise these two, it can look very political when you've got these two um, panels running and having been commissioned like that um, by the two major political parties, but the, the findings from the two groups were very similar. Uh, effectively, on the terms of reference were slightly different, but on the points in which the terms of reference coincided, our findings were uh, essentially identical. Our terms of reference were threefold. I'm really going to focus on the first of these today. 
One was to, just to assess the water management arrangements and the conditions that led up to the events. What, what were, how did those various factors contribute to what actually occurred? To assess the effectiveness of the, the fish management response by um, fisheries agencies and other government departments. And then to provide a series of recommendations about how we can potentially both manage the recovery and then minimise also the risk of future events occurring. So in terms of this first terms of reference, uh, there are a number of things that we needed to consider, and I appreciate the text here is really small, but the, the, effectively they revolved around understanding the, the extent to which uh, the, the climatic setting, and that's both in the summer period itself, but also over the years leading up to that, uh, to the 2018-19 summer, how the, the climate, how the hydrology of the river um, together influenced what occurred, but then more broadly how that was also then um, the extent to which water management arrangements were also a contributing factor. It's worth emphasising, and this just shows a time series um, of from um, back in 2015 through to 20, 2019. Um, in, in 2016, there was a, a major flood event that came down the Darling, and that, that triggered very successful breeding and recruitment of native fish, including golden perch and Murray cod. So, in fact, these events occurred against a backdrop in which very large numbers of fish were, were um, living quite happily in the lower Darling. And in fact, it, it's clearly, particularly below Menindee itself, a, a really uh, quite a remarkable um, fishery. But I guess I just want to emphasise that the, the water management, and that includes the management of environmental flows, uh, and there's been very specific efforts to, to release water from uh, the Menindee Lakes to help trigger um, and support breeding and recruitment of, of fish like golden perch and, and Murray cod in this section of the river. Those efforts have been very successful. And it, it, there's sort of a, a tragic irony there that it, in some ways the number of fish that were there in the river to be affected by the, the conditions that prevailed last summer um, some degree a, a testimony to um, our successful management of water in, in that part of the river to support native fish. So, so the lead up, and, and for those who are interested in sort of in looking at more detail, um, these, these next few slides come directly from our report, which is available on, online. You can download it as a PDF, and there's a short, shorter summary document as well, which walks through what occurred in terms of the management of the lakes uh, Prior to, over the, the several years prior to these events, uh, and then also during the events themselves. But I guess the key, the key point here really is that we started with a connection event uh, in um, 2016. There were good numbers of fish, and obviously with the age of some of the fish that died, um, these fish have been able to effectively um, survive and grow very well in this lower section of the Darling over, over many years. As we came into the drought, and I'll talk more about the drought in a moment, those pools disconnected, and as is commonly the case uh, when, when rivers stop flowing, and particularly these deeper water holes, accumulated organic matter and the like in, on the river, riverbed start to use up the oxygen. And without any flow, there's no mixing of the water column, and the water column stratifies. And so you get these lower, lower sections of, the, of the, the water column have no oxygen in them. Fish may go down there to feed, um, but they, our understanding is they spend most of their time in the, in the um, shallower parts of the water column where there's still more oxygen available. Now, we had very warm conditions uh, over the summer period, and that was a contributing factor to algal blooms occurring. Um, those algae can be toxic to humans and to animals, but they're not, the blue-green algae here are not actually toxic to the fish. They're not responsible for the fish deaths themselves, but what they do do is that when those algae die, they also start to, as they break down uh, and are broken down by bacteria, the cells, that, that also depletes oxygen from the water. So the algal blooms were a contributing factor in so, in so much as when the algae die, they, the, the decay uses up oxygen. Now, <coughs> and I'll show a graph of this in the next slide, we had each of these, these um, the fish kills themselves coincided with period of warm conditions that was then followed by a sudden cool change coming through. And what happens is, is because of the density of the water is affected by the temperature, when, when it's the warmer water floats close to the surface, that, that um, low oxygen water that's near the bottom is very cold. 
when these cool changes come through, that, that cools down the very surface layer of water, which it gets denser. And that, that cooling of that surface water together with wind causes what's known as a turnover event. This happens in lakes, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, every year. It's a very well understood process, but it can happen in river channels that aren't flowing as well. And that sudden turnover event mixes the water column. So that low oxygen water that was in the deep pools within the riverbed is suddenly mixed right through the water column by this turnover. Suddenly you haven't got enough oxygen anywhere in the water for fish to survive. And that's what, that's what kills, ultimately kills them. So it's these turnover events, this mixing of low oxygen water at the bottom with surface water that ultimately occurred on three separate occasions in, in, the, in the lower Darling. And those, those are shown here, these two um, lines here show the, um, the temperature over the period of um, December and January and then the actual change in temperature from one day to the next. And you can see that the, the three dots show the fish kills and you can see that the, 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 the line showing the change in temperature dipped down on each of those occasions when we had this cool, these cool changes come through. So this incredibly strong association with this sudden drop in temperature following a warm period, which leads to these turnover events. So in terms of what actually happened at Menindi, we understand that process really well. Unfortunately, the risk of these conditions arising is increasing very rapidly. This shows the number of extreme heat days at Menindi um, going back to the 1970s, and you can see well, sorry, actually earlier in this graph, it's going back um, to the 1920s. You can see that since around 1980 through to, to now, there's been a very sharp increase in the number of really hot days out there. Now, unfortunately, this is, if you like, a, a, a clear evidence of um, changes that are occurring in our climate. And what they highlight is the risk of these sort of events is going to likely to remain high into the future uh, with, with future drought cycles. So we know what happened in terms of why the fish died, but the, the other really critical questions are to what degree did different factors contribute to that? Was it the operation of Menindi Lakes? There was one view that said that they were drained faster than normal. Um, there was a, another view that upstream water extraction had caused a lack of flow in the Darling River in the period leading up to the fish deaths. And then another was that it was really due to climate change, uh, drought and climate influences alone. So we really wanted to be able to unpack and, and provide advice to government on which of these, whether any of these were, and to the community, because there are a lot of questions being asked, obviously, um, what the relative contribution of these different uh, factors was. This graph shows the Darling is, unlike rivers in the southern basin, it, 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 it does stop flowing um, from time to time, in fact, quite regularly, although the, the the frequency and duration of those no-flow periods is getting more um, common as well as, and we're seeing that as a trend as well as the changes in extreme heat days. But when you look at the drawdown, and there's various uh, intergovernmental agreements um, that determine the operation of Menindi Lakes, but this, this graph here shows the volume of storage in the lakes as a function of time through the year for each of the major filling events that have occurred since the lakes were um, enlarged for, um, for um, you know, water management purposes. And, and the, the most recent event this from 2016 filling is this one that extends for furthest out to the right. Okay, so the point I want to highlight here is that, that the way that the lakes were drawn down since 2016 when they filled was, in, was firstly in accordance with the, the, the stated um, operating rules. Um, but second, because it was recognised that the drought was, um, was worsening, uh, there was actually quite a conservative drawdown event and that's why that tail was much longer than previous years. So in fact, uh, even in 2018, New South Wales government were already trying to um, hold more water back than they had in the past in Menindi Lakes to try and maintain a base flow in the river to try and protect water quality. So essentially, the, this, this sort of um, notion that the, the lakes were drained quickly uh, was not, we didn't find any evidence of that. Uh, it is true to say that the lakes, in relative terms, the lakes are one of the first places that 
uh, MDBA go to to um, supply water to South Australia uh, in preference to storages like uh, the Hume and Dartmouth upstream because the evaporation losses from the Menindee lakes are huge. They lose, if you leave water sitting out in those lakes for a long time, you'll lose it to evaporation. And so the Menindee lakes are essentially the first um, port of call when it comes to supplying water to South Australia because the evaporation rates and losses from those upstream storages are much, much lower. But how they were operated you know, from 2016 through to, to 2018-19 was not inconsistent with the past. Severe drought, now we, I think we've, we've only seen the, the severity of the drought uh, increase. The, these graphs here show the period from um, September uh, 2016 through to um, January 2019 and, and you can see and uh, all of this information can come, you can access it from the Bureau of Meteorology website. They provide regular drought updates and unfortunately the drought which hasn't yet broken across the basin, it's particularly severe in the north, is now seen as one of the worst droughts on, on the instrumental record, so one of the worst droughts in the last um, 200 years. Um, it's clearly been a major factor in terms of what's gone on in Menindi. And that's reflected, in, this graph here shows the inflows into uh, storages uh, in the northern basin, so the dams on the, on the tributaries of the Barwon Darling. And uh, this, these, these five lines here are the, um, the five driest inflow sequences, so the five years of lowest inflow into those storages um, that, have, that have been recorded. And it's this bottom one here, and again, the point is not really showing anything, but that, that low line there is, is the, the filling of those storages um, <laughs> over the period um, from 2017 to 2019. So inflows into those storages have been incredibly low. It's not how they've been operated. It's just that the, the drought has meant there's very little water in that northern basin system. And commensurate with that is a, a huge decrease in the water that's been used for irrigation. So uh, most of the water use, and, and there's pressure, it really should all be being metered, but most of the water use is now metered. And this just shows the, the water use in the years um, 2017, 18 and 19, or 16, 17, 18, 19. Uh, let me get that right. 16, 17, 17, 18 and 18, 19. And you can see that as, as flows and volumes of water that are available in the north have decreased, so too has water use considerably. Uh, so water users, I know there's been, uh, it's acknowledged that there's uh, been cases of illegal water use in the, in the northern parts of the basin and, and many of you, you would have seen those in the media reports as well but I think that, sh that the spotlight that was shone on that has had a big impact on uh, examples of, of water theft and, um, and it's fair to say that you know, the vast majority of water users in the northern basin are doing the right thing and using only that water that they're entitled to and when there's not much water available in the system their entitlements get, and access goes down. One of the particular question marks about water use that comes up is these, what are referred to as A-class uh, extractions. A-class extractions are um, volumes of water that, that um, rights holders can pump from the river during periods of relatively low flow in the northern basin. They account for a very small volume of water, the overall um, water entitlements that um, uh, rights holders have access to, but they do tend to get used during dry periods. That's essentially what they were originally um, designed for, to support permanent plantings during dry periods. And there, there are a number of issues around the, um, the, the Barwon Darling water sharing plan in terms of certain provisions that were made in 2012 that have, if you like, increased the accessibility of those A-class uh, licences. And you can see that the use of that water has ramped up in the last few years, in the period post-2016, when flows have been low and one of the recommendations that we actually made was that those, whilst the use of those A-class licences, the volumes of water were so small that they wouldn't have actually ever made it down to Menindi. So that water extraction post the filling event in 2016 and post the 2016 flow event in the Darling, they wouldn't have actually, if that water hadn't have been extracted, it wouldn't have made any difference to where the water got to Menindi. But we certainly were very concerned about 
the impacts of this, these low flow water use patterns on the general resilience of the ecosystem. And so one of our recommendations was that the government should consider recovering those licences. And in fact, that's one of the commitments that um, the Water Minister has made, is to um, uh, make the money available for that. So our findings essentially, and again, I apologise the text is very small here, so I won't dwell on it, but really, firstly, the, the combination of high, high temperatures with sudden cool change, high biomass of fish and algae in water holes around Menindi were the factors that locally led to those turnover events and the fish deaths. But more broadly, that it was the, um, the combination of the drought uh, on uh, water availability in the system that was the primary cause of a lack of flow in the Darling rather than current water use arrangements. Um, nonetheless, we clearly, if we want to avoid these sort of events occurring in the future, uh, and I don't think we're necessarily going to be able to avoid them altogether, but, but among our recommendations were the need to review the current water management arrangements to, in light of this to examine what, what can be done to reduce the risk. Now, there were a number of measures that the federal government um, responded with. Uh, the, the Water Minister announced a package of $70 million worth of investment um, across a range of measures that included the recovery of those A-class licences, also the implementation of a native fish management and recovery strategy, uh, funding to assist with um, uh, supporting native fish um, uh, reintroductions and, and breeding in hatcheries, uh, improved improvements, the finalisation, if you like, of the, the metering of water use in the Northern Basin, again noting that um, a lot of cons what this really has shone a, a, a lot of attention on is the concern in the community about things like illegal water use. Um, in addition, uh, significant funding of um, ongoing research and monitoring to, to better understand the, the causes what we can do really, to, we understand the cause, I think it's really about understanding uh, what we can do to help native fish recover, but also perhaps to better uh, identify the, when conditions like this might arise, not just in the Lower Darling, but in other rivers. Uh, and in fact, we saw instances elsewhere across New South Wales last summer where fish, more <coughs> significant fish kills were averted by very strategic releases of environmental flows from storages to, um, prevent serious water quality issues arising. And I think being able to identify, having a good early warning system for those events would be a huge strategic advantage in being able to manage water to really um, protect water quality during dry periods and during extreme weather events. So a number of measures like that that were, were announced by the government. I'm almost out of time, so I just want to wrap up on a couple of other things. The first is that there's been a huge focus on the native fish impacts of these events, rightly so. Uh, but the broader ecosystem is also suffering. Things like mussels which, uh, and other uh, crayfish and yabbies, which are an important food source for native fish, are among the other animals which are also being massively affected, as well as smaller bodied native fish. Things like mussels, they grow, they, they grow very slowly. Their biology has already been heavily disrupted by poor water quality and declining native fish stocks. They need native fish to be able to breed successfully. Their larvae attach themselves to fish. Uh, they don't do them any harm, but they need that, that, those fish numbers um, locally to be able to go through their life cycle. They've dwindled as well, and they, they also have a big impact as filter feeders on water quality, so they're an important part of the ecosystem. And then the community as well. I mentioned the Barkinji, but the, all other members of the community along the Darling are really being affected by, um, by these events. We heard all sorts of <laughs> lots of stories about um, the fact that when there's no water in the river, crime rates tend to go up in, in some of the towns along the river. So it, it goes to some of the other things we've heard this morning around the importance of uh, being, people being able to um, enjoy themselves in a really positive way and the enjoyment that people draw from, from healthy rivers. Um, that really rang true when we talked to community members out west. Looking to the to the where we are now, uh, again, <coughs> pardon me. As Anthony mentioned, New South Wales Fisheries, you know, with support from Victoria and other agencies and community members, have done a lot of work to try and relocate fish. 
um, particularly to the Lower Darling. I think they've moved somewhere in the vicinity of 600 odd Murray Cod, primarily, uh, I think also Golden Perch, um, to more sec permanent sections of the river downstream in an effort to at least um, give some of those fish that survived last summer a fighting chance. Um, but we know that there will probably be further fish kills this summer, uh, given the, the current drought trends and the, and the absence of any um, the drought breaking thus far. And there'll also be an ongoing loss of permanent water holes as well as those, um, those more significant sudden drastic fish kills. So there's also a lot of work underway with MDBA, um, New South Wales, DPIE and fisheries to again get um, aeration units out on the river early this summer. Uh, and they've, done, they've used the information that was collected last summer to, to, to identify those strategies that work best for those aerators. So those programs are now already being put in place. So final slide, really just, um, I think we do have to recognise these short term local efforts are really insufficient to actually ultimately um, get us to where we need to be, which is to try and um, avoid these sort of events occurring on such a large scale and also to support native fish recovery. And that's got to be a huge effort. We are going to have to continue to review water use arrangements if we're going to um, get that balance right, I think, between irrigation and, and healthy rivers. Uh, and that's an ongoing um, conversation because there's, there's impacts on both sides. So that's a really challenging one. I'll emphasise that from my point of view where I stand, I see the, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan as the, the best instrument to facilitate that. There is a review every 10 years of those arrangements uh, and, and that provides an important opportunity at, a, at an appropriate frequency to really ask where are we at in terms of the balance between um, all those competing water demands uh, and whether we've got the balance right. So with that, I'll thank you and also acknowledge um, both the other members, particularly the other members of the panel. Um, Rob Vitesi, who chaired it, Fran Sheldon, Darren Barmer, Lee Baumgartner and Simon Mitrovic. It was a great team to work with on this issue, but also acknowledge the various state agencies, Commonwealth agencies and the members of the community we work with. Thank you. Thank you.